Yes, uh, I, I echo uh, other speakers. I uh, thank the organizers for including uh, me in, the, in, the, in this workshop. It's uh, a lot of wonderful uh, different types of real-time control and, and, uh, and, and forecasting. Um, so I'm going to talk about basically a follow-up to Stephen's, uh, Steve Lowe's talk on how to manage the power grid. And um, this is joint work with Anna Bushich, who's in the audience. Um, uh, where is she? Right there. Uh, and uh, 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 several students have been involved, in particular Joel uh, Matias and uh, Yui Chen at Florida. And Yui Chen's just about to graduate. So if anybody's looking for postdocs or, or employees, uh, let me know. And you know, thanks to our sponsors, Google, NSF, and DOE have, have funded this work. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to talk about the challenges with renewable integration more than anything, and, and also challenges of distributed generation, all of that. Um, and a lot of the challenges are because of the fact that we really need better thinking about control strategies and all of that. We have to really get back to basics, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Now, demand dispatch, that term is something that's a bit vacuous. that came out of a Google vision paper just trying to redefine how you might engage loads. It's the main reason for using that word is we don't want to say demand response because if you look up the definition on the FERC website or the Department of Energy website, it means shutting down loads for monetary reward, and we we're never talking about that. You know, we're, 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 we don't want to, to you know cause chaos among consumers if we're using loads to help regulate the grid. Um, so, uh, an example of challenges just on this first page. Um, I'm not, so I started in this area looking at the economics of power, like real-time markets. And I feel like that's the biggest challenge. It causes so much trouble. <laughs> and they're seeing problems today because when, when the generators have to ramp up quickly because of the sun goes down in the afternoon in California, you get massive price spikes. And people complain about the disruption to the market. <laughs> and you should change the market. So I'm not going to get into the economics, but one of the biggest challenges we face is that there's this entrenched view of how you should do control through prices, and that's not compatible with the real problem. So that's not my talk, <laughs> but I want to say it at least once. Okay. So in, in power systems, one of the biggest challenges historically is a big sunk cost. I'm a generation company. I have to spend a billion dollars for a power plant. I'm stuck with that now for 40 years. <laughs> every day a staff comes in, I've got to pay them every day. <laughs> you know, I, I've got, and this, this running cost of fuel, but that's not the big deal. I've got the interest payments on that loan. And that's what's ignored in most economic treatments. You know, so that's a huge challenge all the time, and it's, it's just as big today. This engineering uncertainty, we might find out that batteries are free tomorrow. And all this work on demand response is, or demand dispatch is out the window, because batteries are this big and, and, and store a gigawatt hour of power. <laughs> I doubt it. it. Sounds dangerous. But you know, there's, there's, we don't know what the future is going to bring. The policy uncertainty is huge. Uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, changes the rules all the time. Everyone has to rethink how they're going to do things. Um, and then there's volatility, which is an engineering challenge that's easier for us all to talk about. And so we'll start at the bottom. But all these three issues are huge and equally important. You know? But this is a thing that we could all knock out. We could solve this in a few years. Just like when, when suddenly there was the internet and it didn't look like it was going to work. Everybody thought it was an impossible control problem. Within five years, we did it, right? <laughs> you know, the, I mean, you know, we, meaning the collective engineering community, solved it. You know, because it's incredible ingenu ingenuity in, in, our, in our field. Um, we could just knock this out if we were given the chance. Um, these other things are harder to, to deal with as in our community. Okay. So volatility. So one thing people talk about the last few years is ramps. The fact that this is wind generation in the Pacific Northwest, this green area, and you'll have a day of no wind at all. And it'll ramp up. That's like two nuclear power plants coming online. <laughs> And the slope is something that's a big concern, as well as the, the low frequency volatility. Um, this is a typical day. It just happens to be the first week of, of 2015. You know, I, it was picked because it was, a, it was the day before I was going to give a lecture. <laughs> it was a screenshot. Um, so those ramps are a concern. And the, the, these are two consecutive weeks from a prior year. One, one week where there was no uh, w generation from wind at all, and another where it went up to four gigawatts nearly and then to zero. Um, 
And what happens is that there are, because of these shocks to the system, it creates volatility in supply and demand like Steve uh, talked about. And you need generators or other resources to ramp up and down power to smooth out the flow. And that's what this is. So signals are sent to hydro generators in this region. They open and close the valves to let more power, you know, inject more and less power into the grid. And on a, on a day with less wind, it's smaller than a day with big wind. Whether that's a big deal or not, I don't know. Hydro generators hate it. And do you know why? You know. You know, well, they don't like putting the stress in the machines. But mainly, if they're asked to go up and down like that, it means they have to withhold power so they don't get to sell as much energy. Yeah. If they have to ramp up and down, they're reaching their limit down. Reaching their limit down, they don't get to sell as much energy because they can't be selling at, the, at their max continuously. So that's the biggest anger is what's called opportunity cost. They don't get to sell power. So huge fights in this region. The hydrogenators don't like having to do this instead of this. Um, so why is it that I'm so confident we could all solve this? It's so similar to an air, uh, air, aerospace problems. I mean, you, you know we've all been in airplanes with incredible turbulence and storms. And we all know that, that the, the plane, the, wait, wait, did I skip a slide? I guess, I guess something got, I think a slide got deleted. It doesn't matter. That's good. Um, we all know that airplanes do a beautiful job of, of controlling the system. Yeah, I, I did delete a slide. I don't know how it happened. But you think about an airplane. You've got a flight control system, intelligence there. You've got these big, massive um, uh, jet engines, you know, which, are, which are analogous to the bulk power in a, in, a, in a power grid. And you've also got ailerons and flaps, which are very much analogous to this fine-tuning of, of supply and demand that we saw before. Okay? And it, basically what you have is you've got a balancing authority, which is the brains, and the California ISO is basically solving this OPF that Steve talked about, doing all sorts of other things. They send commands to generators to ramp up and down their power, and the grid itself has dynamics. You know, we talked about admittance matrices a moment ago, and there's a big feedback loop, and believe it or not, they really do it like this. They measure g g global features, uh, the phase, the, the frequency of, of, the, uh, of the power in the grid, and some other things. They put it through a PI compensator, a proportional integral compensator, and that is what's sent to those generators to ramp up and down. It's, it's amazing that it works. That's, at least that's one layer of control. So if airplanes can be so robust and handle such massive disturbances, why can't the grid? I don't see any reason. I think we could handle it. Okay, so let's, let's give some examples about how a control person would solve the, the issues today. So this is this California duck curve that's talked about. So you've got the, the net load is 20 gigawatts. It drops down to 10 gigawatts and then shoots up again. This is what people expect to see in, in 2020. It drops down because of solar energy. The sun comes up, so the net load the load minus the energy from the sun you know, goes way down. And it's the ramp today that's scaring them. And it's scaring them partly because of the markets. The markets, the prices shoot up. And it's a lack of resources. You know, that's what's happening. There aren't enough fast generators that can follow that ramp. And it causes problems in markets. But, and so today there's, there's a market, there's an auction for ramp up products and an auction for ramp down products. It makes me want to scream. <laughs> so we could solve this problem as an aerospace engineer. You'd say, well, there's a, there's a trajectory I'd like to attract. My airplane can do that very easily. <laughs> My generators can ramp up slowly, ramp down slowly. That's, that problem solved. And now there's a deviation signal I have to deal with through the flaps and ailerons. All right. So then you look at the difference. And you get a couple of zero energy signals. One is low frequency and one is higher frequency. You find other resources, not maybe. Ba batteries are being pushed in California. Boy, that's annoying. <laughs> batteries are being pushed in, in California. But the, the, the size of a battery to supply that, that blue curve would take over probably all of, you know, all of San Mateo County. You know, it would be a you know, massive, massive uh, uh, system. So uh, obviously, I'm, t I'm thinking about loads to supply these, these services. OK, how about a contingency? Now, so here, this was uh, taking the duct curve and putting it through a non-causal low-pass filter. If there's a contingency, say a sudden loss of generation, 
we don't know when it's going to happen, so we have to use a, we'd use a causal filter to smooth that out. Something like that. So a generator can handle that. It can't handle suddenly supplying this power due to an outage. If you had batteries to follow this, tr this uh, total uh, signal, you'd have to discharge the batteries here and then recharge them here. But instead, you could use loads. You know, so you could look at a you know, mid-pass and other, you know, look at a frequency decomposition of the error and use different resources uh, for, each, for each, each, each of these frequency bands to, to track this signal. Okay? And this, the highest signal here maybe would be batteries. This thing here we'll discuss in the talk what resources might provide that, that blue curve. Right. Again, these are zero energy signals, so think about batteries, but batteries are expensive and they don't last forever. They take energy. You know, that 32 megawatt hour battery in San Diego has a huge air conditioning system around it. It costs a fortune and it uses a lot of space. All right, so what, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose that the load in this region was exactly four gigawatts. And suppose you were told you have to take all the wind, which is a policy in the Pacific Northwest. They have to take all the wind. That's the contract that's been signed with the wind generators. Uh, just as an academic exercise, suppose that the load was exactly four gigawatts. Then you'd have a net load. Yeah, that's what this is saying. There's a residual generation I'd have to supply. Um, you'd have a net load that looks like this. So when there was no wind, you'd need four gigawatts from generation. And then you'd have to shut down because of the wind. There's lots of, you know, and over here, there's lots of wind, so you don't need so much residual generation. You know, how, would you, how would you track this net load? You do the same thing. You know, this very predictable low frequency component, which the hydro generators could easily supply. And of course, they don't like being shut down. <laughs> you know? And of course, dams do overflow. There are constraints. But anyway, in most cases, you could, they could be happy to do this. And again, you do the same thing. You, go th you have a mid-pass and a high-pass signal. And let's solve this problem. So it's, it, there's a, one way of thinking about this is I'm, I'm proposing is a frequency decomposition. We need a resource for the blue curve. We need a resource for the purple curve. And the question is, where do we, where do we find the resources? And it won't be batteries. You know, maybe batteries will supply part of it, but not all. Let's do it. So there's a big push for this in California. There's, there's a, the, the California Public Utility Commission has report after report on thinking about ways to engage loads to provide that service. But they write, to our dismay, very little demand response capacity has been integrated into the California market to date. And they keep trying. Well, loads aren't generators. <laughs> How are they going to do this bidding when with the, what, the, what California needs is that, you know? <laughs> and how on earth are loads going to bid and create this signal? It makes no sense. And so we've got to rethink what demand side resources will do. They're not generators. They're not going to bid in the same way. And each individual load, like this building, you know, isn't going to contribute very much. You need a big aggregate. You know? And we, you know, so we have, to, we have to have models of demand in the right way. In New York, there's sort of a revolution because Audrey Zibelman came in as a public service commissioner, and she wants to completely redo New York. And, and she wants that uh, demand resources be the first resort for managing the grid. So she's right on. But she needs engineers to talk to and not just economists. And so far, that's who she's talking to. So it's really tough. So anyway, let's do it. So in this you know, remaining half hour, let's try to think about how we would actually solve this problem as engineers and, and, and not as economists. Right. So mainly, we're going to think about, you know, only, you know, it's easy to think about how aluminum manufacturing can engage in contracts with California ISO and agree to reduce their load at two, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, you know, for the big industrial uh, power consumers, it's kind of easy to think about how you engage in contracts. Um, the reason that we've been focusing on residential consumers is mainly because it looks so hard at first. You've got on-off loads like water heaters and air conditioners and pool pumps. And, and our goal, if, if our goal is to track something like that, it's hard to imagine how you would do that with a water heater or pool pumps. And so, we, so we're focusing on what looks like the harder problem, but I want to argue it's not as hard as it looks. Okay? So we're going to have an on-off load and, and look at how we can design distributed control algorithms to, to solve this problem. 
Okay, and this is joint work with Anna Bushic, and I just, you know, we, we received a Google Research Award last year for, for some of this work. Okay, so again, the, the goal is to ob obtain these resources. The first one, maybe, maybe traditional generation combined with what, what people call demand resp dis response today, you know, contracts with aluminum manufacturing companies, I don't know. But uh, the blue, uh, the purple curve here, water pumping in California is 19% of the load. One gigawatt of that is from pool pumps, <laughs> just from filtration, <laughs> residential pool pumps. A gigawatt max, you know, 500 megawatts on average. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> Same thing in Florida. Uh, but, you know, water pumping for, for sanitation, you know, just pump stations after you flush the toilet. You know, it goes somewhere and has to be pumped at some point. Um, and also irrigation, of course. Water is pumped over the Sierra Madres and... and, and, and yeah. Um, fans and commercial buildings are amazing. I mean, how, how they're good for this uh, high frequency resources. And, uh, and, and basically, this term now, demand dispatch, you know, let's take this as a, as a term for what we want to do. We want to, uh, power consumption from loads to vary automatically and continuously to provide service to the grid and without impacting quality of service to the consumer, you know. If, if they have a contract that we, we will not change their temperature by one degree, we will never violate that, that contract. You know? we, so we, we don't want to cause Armageddon, you know, <laughs> ever. Um, so this, you know, it's a balancing act. We want to provide these services to the grid, and we don't want any impact on QoS. Okay. So um, we have to say what we need. So the grid operator wants high-quality ancillary service. So ancillary service means these services that aren't you know, directly energy, like the the regulation signals I showed before, these zero energy signals. Now, generators do a lousy job. You know? So basically, if you look at a good generator, um, the requested is the dash line, and what was received is the blue line. There's a big gap between what they provide and what's actually asked for. This is a bad generator with a huge phase lag. Sometimes they're asked to go up and they go down. This is reality, and the grid still works. So we don't have to be perfect, you know. And it's because of the fact that we're looking at these lower frequency uh, issues. The, the, these time scales, on time, you know, these time scales are minutes, a few minutes to hours, and that's where Steve Lowe argued that it's basically an algebraic equation. And I'll, I'll, I, can, I can say more about that. When you get to time scales of seconds, stability really is an issue. And if the, and if the generators were doing that, the grid would blow up. Okay. Um, so we want reliability. We all know what that means. You know, if you say ramp down, ramp down, capacity might be variable. It might be vary per day or per hour. This periodicity is, as Balji pointed out, but it should be predictable, and it, it will be. Um, cost effective, we know what that means. Incentives to the consumer being reliable. I mean, basically, it's a contract in place. I want to understand my bill. You know, and, and sometimes some of the schemes that have come out, the, the, the uh, bills are white noise. I mean, th some of the studies at Pacific Northwest National Labs, the, the bills were uncorrelated with the flexibility offered in some cases. Um, and then this, of course, quality of service constraints, I've already said this. We want the refrigerator to stay cold and, and all of this. I don't have to go into that. So again, the de definition of demand dispatch is to achieve all these goals simultaneously. And, th and, and just, you need distributed control because of the fact that we've got, you've got to take measurements at the load to make sure QoS constraints are met, you know, and you've got to do some shaping of the response so the grid operator sees reliable, high-quality ancillary service. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about one approach to design. I, I mean, I know that there's going to be many others that come around. So here's one approach to design. This is all for, mainly for on-off load. I mean, in this talk, all on-off loads. I've got a load here. Think about a refrigerator. It's either on or it's off. Um, there's going to be some sort of local control. There's going to be a regulation signal. Whenever you see Zeta, that's from a balancing authority, from, a, you know, from an aggregator. It's a one signal that's sent to all the loads of the same class, to every refrigerator. And there's some local control, which there's layers and layers here. And the load makes a decision based on you know, the U is, do I turn on or off? Um, and it's going to do so based on some state information for refrigerator that could be the temperature and whether I'm on or off. And so based on two, so it's state information and, and based on this broadcast signal, it'll make a decision to turn on or off. And so far in our work, we've had a pre-filter, 
in this, so we, we, we transform zeta so it's more suitable for the load. And there's a decision process here, which is, which is something that I'll talk about, not in too much depth, because that would take a long time. But I'll give you, I'll give you the main idea. Okay, so there's pre-filtering decision rules. And the thing is that you've got to have randomized policies. I mean, it's absurd to think you can't. I, I mean, what else? You need the degrees of freedom. If this is an on-off load, you need to somehow convexify this problem. And randomization is, is the way to go. And that's, that's, I think, well, you know, that seems clear. Okay, so based by randomization, I mean it's a state transition matrix. That's the way we've modeled it. So basically, for each load, we're going to design a family of transition matrices. Uh, so P zeta X to X prime is the probability the state goes from X to X prime given that the balancing authority signal is, is zeta. All right, so it's a controlled transition matrix we have to design. And the problem is, so Steve, you asked me to get, get into the mathematical details and not make it too high level. And I thought, wow, well maybe I'll go and spend some time to explain how to do these designs. It takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll explain one simple design, uh, but uh, we've, we've looked at three different designs and each one of them takes some, some work. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit, but I can't go into much detail. Um, what's that? Uh, oh, good, good. Thank you. Power consumption. <laughs> thank, yeah, I forgot to say that. Yeah, so why will always denote power consumption. Thank you. Cause we, and so basically, um, water heaters in California, commercial water heaters, the total consumption is one gigawatt. And if you look at if you look at the power consumption, it's flat. And we're going to make it. We're going to deviate that. We want to make it consume a bit more, a bit less, a bit more, a bit less. And so our, our the grid operator's interest is why the power consumption. Yeah, thank you. That should be written in bold. Power consumption. <laughs> and you is am I, am I on, turning on or off? Okay, so how to design P zeta is, is a long topic. It, 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 just, it just takes too much time. How to analyze the aggregate, I'll talk about a bit. That's an old, old topic. And, um, and I'm going to illustrate how this thing works through simulations and, and examples. Okay, so Roland Malamé in, in 84 had a paper responding to the work of Fred Schweppe, who is sort of considered the father of all the de, you know, demand response ideas. And he, you know, he looked at this uh, empirical distribution of a lot of, of TCLs, like refrigerators. Basically, he had a, he had a, a continuous state in his, his, his model. And he, he considered a histogram of the, of the loads, just, just modeling the loads no, you know, with no local control. Um, so basically, I'm looking at the proportion of loads in each particular state at a particular time t. And this is not the evolution, but as you, I mean, sorry, this is, this is a histogram. It's approximated by a probability distribution mu t, which evolves according to these state equations. So mu is considered a row vector, p was a transition matrix, and that's the evolution equations. So it's linear in the uh, state, and nonlinear in the, in the input zeta. All right? Now, the, the difference with the prior work is that we want to design P zeta to get good input output behavior. That's been the goal. Okay? Now, why? Why again is, is power? <laughs> and there's some function u of x. u is the power consumption when I'm in state x. In all the examples I'm going to talk about, that's either, it says, takes on two values, say one kilowatt or zero. I'm either on or off. Okay. And so that's, that's the average power consumption over all the loads uh, in this mean field model at time t. Okay, so it's a nonlinear state space model. We've looked at linearization for control design. That's not necessary, but it's been incredibly effective in all the simulation experiments we've done. You know, so we, you know, it's almost embarrassing how we have to go back to classical control. It works so well. You know, we want to you know, use optimal control or something. We've got this sexy nonlinear equation. but. I don't know if there's any point. Uh, you know, classical control is working so well. <laughs> Just linearize the thing and go. All right. So, and you know, this is an example. These are swimming pools, you know, a thousand swimming pools uh, tracking a regulation signal through this sort of design. Now, linear, so, a thought experiment. Refrigerators have a period of one hour about. They're on a half hour, they're off a half hour. If you had a million refrigerators and you wanted to track a square wave, you could do it, right? <laughs> if you had a square wave of a period of one hour, you'd say, pools off, wait 30 minutes, pools on, 30 minutes. You'd get a perfect regulation signal, track a square wave, exactly, full capacity, right? 
<laughs> All right. What I'm getting at is if you try to track a square wave of a period of five hours, that sounds a bit scary, right? Because you, you turn the, the fridges off for five hours, something bad's going to happen. You know? Now, the thing is that you, maybe you can track a, a low-frequency square wave, but at much lower capacity. You know? So there's a sweet spot for load. For refrigerators, it's an hour. They like to supply a regulation signal for a period of an hour. They don't like five hours, and they don't like a millisecond. So what happens when you linearize? You know? when, when you linearize, you get, so these are three different designs. And here are the linearizations, the input-output behavior. Uh, for a refrigerator, you get a resonance, and the resonance is at its sweet spot, one hour. You know? And so they really like providing ancillary service in a certain bandwidth around their, 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 their nominal frequency. They don't like low, low frequencies, and they shouldn't like high frequencies either. Okay. And so that's, that's, what, that's what you find in every example. Yep. So what, uh, I mean, apropos of this randomization of the single refrigerator, was it just multiplexing the, you know, uh, shutdown across several households? Yeah. You go down for an hour, the next hour somebody else goes down. That's not possible, because like, if you look at this Nest thermostat type companies, yeah. uh, they have a large number of people in the neighborhood using them. Mm -hmm. So take one fraction, a fraction of the homes and get them down like, for some time on a different fraction for the next you know, yeah. period. You can get a five hour stretch, but not a single, you know. Yeah. Uh, Everything's about an aggregate. We, we, you know. So, I, I mean, with 200 swimming pools, we can track a regulation signal beautifully. Right, but yeah. that's not possible because the home automation guys are, you know. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna convince Nest that they're not thinking right. Actually, Anna and I visited Nest uh, the day before yesterday and, and, and talked with them. No, no, they, they're going to have to change their business model. <laughs> no, they do. They're going to have to talk to control people. They, 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 they're, they're too isolated from control people. They think, that they, can, they think the neural nets and economists are going to solve their problems, but uh, they, they need to talk to some real control people. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I, I just know that they, you know, that they could see how much they could get out of uh, the, the thermostats, if they did it right, they will, they'll, they'll change their business model. Okay. So anyway, there's a refrigerator, and I don't think I'll have time. I was going to actually write down what the myopic design is. You know, I gave you that function u, which is a power consumption in state x. All you're doing is you're, in, you're twisting the, the probability, a nominal probability law, so it favors higher. Ah, I said too much. In all of our work, there's a, there's a nominal behavior, which is modeled by P0 x to x prime. And it's not quite nominal. We tweak it a tiny bit. We add a bit of randomness. You know? So if, if the fridge normally was purely deterministic, as it gets closer to its upper band, we put in a little bit of probability of, of, swi of, of, of switching early. Myopic just means that P zeta x to x prime is proportional to the nominal times e to the zeta u of x prime. <clears throat> so you know, that for each x, that's a probability law. All right? And if zeta is positive, this is going to you know, incentivize to consume more power, because u is a power consumption in state x prime. And if u zeta is negative, it's going to incentivize to go less. So this, is, this blue here is a myopic design. This, this red is an optimal design, which I won't describe, uh, which we can prove lots of things about. But every, every, for example, passivity under certain conditions. But if you look at the, this is a magnitude plot, every three, one of these designs is a strictly positive real passive input output system. They're all awesome. We can prove a lot of things about the other designs, but the myopic design, just for reasons we don't understand, this, this stupid design works really well in all the applications we've looked at. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, can you explain really quick what it why do we need to have a randomization in this? Yeah, well, the thing is that I want, well, it's partly because of the fact that we want, we don't want, we could do one-to-one, -one, and I should say, at Berkeley, they've, they've looked at, at two-way communication with each load, and basically rank the loads in terms of their flexibility to change power state, and then knock them off one by one, you know. But the, the, the goal here is to try to do this with one-way communication, mainly. You know, basically, we want to be able to broadcast a signal of the loads, and then the, they they take care of themselves. They know their power. They know their quality of service, and and 
randomization is is to is to smooth. Yeah, what's well, to smooth out the response, basically, and to get, it's more give more degrees of freedom. It's you know basically you get this wonderful smooth uh, state space model through randomization, you know, and and this thing is designed to be a nice smooth function of zeta. It's it's the fact that we can make this thing a, a linear a linear state space model with smooth dynamics. You can only do that through this randomization. So you know, hypothetically, if you had Turned on or off all the hot water heaters. Oh yeah, we, remember we want to track a signal. We want to perfectly track a reg signal, and I'll give some examples of that. Um, and so basically, because it's because this transfer function is so nice, it turns out to be minimum phase for those of you in control. It turns out to be passive. The linearization is passive. You can invert the dynamics over a certain bandwidth. Now this is too aggressive. Really, we'd only care about the refrigerator in this bandwidth here. But we can so the pre-filter is basically to get rid of the resonance, and to make the grid operator see something that looks more like a battery. So basically, flatten the response, make the phase flat, make the magnitude flat, but not over such a big bandwidth, over a narrower bandwidth. Um, and you can do that through a linear filter, not non-linear filter. Um, so how does it work? Here's an experiment. Here is twenty thousand air conditioners. I think forty thousand air conditioners. 20 different kinds, okay? So each, 20 different brands. You know, some of them had a period of 40 minutes, some of them had a period of an hour and a half. And for each refrigerator, we designed this, the whole thing, with the myopic design, the pre-filter. And then we said, grid operator, it's a battery. <laughs> uh, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge. And it, and open loop, there's no feedback. And the refrigerators track the signal from the balancing authority almost perfectly. And if you compare what a typical fridge does um, with what happened after this procedure, you can't tell the difference. Nobody would know their refrigerator is being tampered with. But you put them all together, and you get this beautiful tracking. Now, this is only 20% of capacity. You'd see more twisting of the from the nominal behavior if you ask for more from them. These are 50% of capacity in the water heaters. We're tracking perfectly. And, and again, we see very little change from the nominal behavior. Yeah. Is, is it one design for each brand of fridge, or is it one design for each fridge given its loading, you know, how, how full it is and so on? Well, given, it, given its nominal behavior. So we, we know this. For, you know, this is, this is, this is, does that depend on how much food I have in my fridge? Or does it uh, yeah, well, in, in, in some low, the, the dynamics of a fridge change a little bit depending on, the, on the, what's inside of it. And that's, that's, a, that's another open problem is how robust is this? If we're off by a tiny bit, does it matter? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you think about control, I mean, if, if this resonant, yeah, there'd be some issues in, in the sensitivity of the pre-filter if you're not just right. You could end up with less flat response. But I'm going to argue that that's, that's, there's a lot of robustness here, so we don't need it to be perfect. So here's the reason for the lot of robustness. <laughs> but I'm going to, yeah, I've got time. Um, this, this Bode plot explains uh, Steve Lowe's remark about in time scales of you know, minutes and, and slower, it's a, a wire. It's just an algebraic equation. And at uh, time scales of seconds and faster, the dynamics, this is an actual transfer function of Texas. <laughs> this is what the balancing authorities in Texas see. There's a, it's like a second order linear system. And uh, there are a lot of uncertainty and issues here. So when you get into time scales of seconds, you're in trouble. Low frequencies, it's algebraic almost. But still, they use proportional integral control when they, when they, uh, they, they do things. Um, so again, there's uncertainty here, so we should be scared. Here, fans in commercial buildings would give you everything else you'd need, basically. This is an inventory. I'm not going to go into details, but just making the fans in this building, this, you know, to move the air around, make, make the fans be a little higher 10%, a little lower 10%, this whole bandwidth gone. Um, refrigerators, water heaters, uh, um, and, and some other loads, cover this bandwidth here. And you've got all that water pumping I mentioned in California and the, and the pool pumps and all of that. They take care of this low frequency bandwidth here. And, and, and I want to show you before, you know, I, I'm almost done. I've got, I've got time. I want to show some simulations to show how this all goes together. Okay. 
So, and also a little bit of, about, again, back to this issue of information. So, Fred Schweppe proposed each refrigerator just look at its local frequency deviation and respond. He had a patent on that. It was never implemented for obvious reasons. He was looking at primary control, this highest frequency business where stability is a real issue. You know? and, and later on, Tabor and students actually introduced some randomness to try to make it work better. But still, the frequency range wasn't good. Is, 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 it's a very sensitive part of the, of the, of the problem. I mean, you, you, you know, basically, they were looking at time scales of seconds. And all these refrigerators responding orders of seconds. You can imagine oscillations that could occur. Um, so our work, up until recently, looked at the aggregate power consumption from a collection of loads. We're not sure we even need that anymore. And I'll, I'll give you a simulation experiment to show why. Work at, at Montreal, you know, D Duncan uh, Calloway and Joanna Matthew, who's now at Michigan, um, they looked at a histogram of the loads you know, and, and use that for control of the, the balancing authority. So the balancing authority had to estimate the whole histogram. And the, pro, the, the difficulty with this, I mean, what, what got us interested in is it was a, it's a bilinear system. You know, so that basically, if you don't do any, here we did a lot of local control to get this nice passive input output system. If you don't do, have all those local feedback loops, if you just leave the fridges alone and you just send them a, a probability law, to send a probability vector. If you're in this state, turn off with this probability. It ends up being a bilinear system. And the theory of bilinear control is just non-existent. So that's, that's why this is, they, they make the, the, the problem for the balancing authority really difficult. They have to solve a, uh, a bilinear control problem. And they do it by state division. And they get successful results. But still, the robustness, there's not much of a, 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 a science for that. Um, so again, I, I don't need to repeat all this. So you've seen this, and we do this pre-filtering. Each load provides service in a limited bandwidth, and uh, and then the balancing authority w would only require grid-level information if you do enough local control. If you do enough local control, so the collection of loads really looks like a battery, then the grid, the balancing authority can say, well, it's a battery. I'll just do what I do with batteries: charge, discharge. So here's some experiments. Um, oh, I'm sorry, but first, not, one more and more statement. Why, why am I so confident? I believe in control. <laughs> when you have a situation like this, all you want, when you want to get good tracking, you just want high gain here, and you don't have to care how much. You know? And so if there's half as many fridges as I thought, big deal. I mean, if there's no fridges, I'm in trouble. <laughs> You know, so you basically just need the, the, the response to be large enough in this region, and you'll get good tracking. And stability is not an issue. It's again, here is where you'd have to be in trouble, and we have to be really careful. So here's experiments to show this uh, point. There's experiments with you know, a million simulations, a million water heaters, a few million I mean, pools, a few million water heaters, and air conditioners, and so forth. And we, we basically thought experiment. We have a fake balancing authority. We tell them, we gave you a battery, and we didn't really. There were loads. <laughs> and we gave you four gigawatts of batteries at low frequencies. Well, we really didn't. There were only two. <laughs> you know, so it's a big mismatch uh, uh, between reality and what the balancing authority thought. And forget this plot. It's too hard to explain. Um, the, the frequency regulation is perfect, you know, basically. So was, there was huge disturbances from wind. There was BPA data in this experiment. And the per disturbance rejection from these loads was perfect. And this is just a comparison of the pools and the generators and how similarly they respond. So, and, and it's all, be all because of this pre-filtering. And the reason the, the signal to them is twice as big as it should be is because there's half as many resources as the balancing authority thought. And so they have to make the signal larger to force. That's the beauty of control. This is all adaptive. I mean, you know, in, it's, it's using integral control. So the error builds up, the signal gets larger, and so it works. Yeah. What period of time are these, let's say you say turn off, I don't know, a gigawatt of hot water heaters, what period of time does that take effect? Yeah. Oh, well, I, like the water heaters would probably get a signal every 10 seconds or something, you know, and they'd make a decision every 10 seconds. And, and I'll, I'll show you a plot wh wh where we can actually watch them go. Is that, you know? so, so let's go back, let's go back to our duck curve. So before I was saying, let's, let's OSCO and decompose into a mid-pass and high-pass signal and then get one set of resources for this, one set of resources for that. Forget that. <laughs> let's, let, let's let the loads do it themselves, you know. The loads all have been told they're batteries now. The balancing authority thinks they're batteries. Let's just close the loop. 
here's what happens. <laughs> so the difference between this and this is this signal here. And all these crazy signals in between are the different loads. So these um, slow water heaters, the water heaters with a period of about an hour, this purple, that's consumption, the negative of that is like generation. And the slow water heaters themselves are practically tracking this, uh, this net load. We want to track this signal here. So the actuator output is the aggregate power deviation from all the resources. Uh, the, the residual load is what we want to track. The tracking's perfect. And, and you see that the, in this experiment, the, the, the big water heaters were the most useful for, for dealing with this. Okay. And these were realistic numbers, the number of millions of water heaters and, and, uh, and, refrigerator, and uh, air conditioners. No refrigerators here. They should be in there as well. Um, and, uh, and the pools didn't do much. It's hard to imagine why they're doing what they're doing. But remember, there's a conflict between ramping and energy. You ask me to ramp up, 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 up. Well, I'm not suddenly consuming energy when I shouldn't be. And so that's why sometimes you see this spaghetti nonsense. You, but you really, if you add them all together, you get exactly what you want. It's just, you know, again, the beauty of control. And so that, I hope that answers your question. And basically, they're receiving a signal every four seconds. And, and they respond in this randomized fashion. But the aggregate follows a smooth curve. And in this case, we didn't ask them to follow that smooth curve. We sent a si si same signal to all the loads, and they pre-filtered and, and provided service in their bandwidth of service. So you keep sending the signal until you reach your... Oh, it's just uh, online. It's, it's a feedback loop here. Right there. Yeah, I, I should have said we do exactly what the grid operator would do today. The, the, there's a, a frequency deviation. I, I should have spent a moment on this. There's a frequency deviation that's measured by the balancing authority. You take the difference between that and 60 hertz. This was just a PI compensator, you know, um, exactly the setting I mentioned before. And then these bandpass uh, filters are really internal to each of the loads. Yeah. And then these all get, all the power deviations get added up. And this is a, the transfer function I showed you. And the loop gets closed. So exactly the model of aerospace engineering, <laughs> you know, where you measure the, you know, yeah. What is the timeline for the computation? Oh, it's, it's PI control, so there's nothing. <laughs> oh, in the load, nothing. I mean, God. Because yeah. they, they have four seconds to make this decision for, for an air conditioner, and for a swimming pool, it would be half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's not, there's no computational issues like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, quick question. Like, the one you implemented, or you, did you implement? This? There's all simulations in MATLAB, yeah. I mean, boy, I wish I had a million water heaters to play with. <laughs> yeah, no way. I, I guess, yeah, maybe I thought of that. What's the plan to implement that? Do you put, like, a control box you plug in the wall, and then you plug the whatever end of Yeah, no, this is an issue. I mean, right now... We, you know, we have to swap out the, the board and put in a new one. I mean, luckily, a lot, a lot of people are building smart refrigerators and water heaters that will be very easy to configure to, to take this. But with, a, you know, with an old fridge, we'll have to pull out the board and stick in a new one. And, uh, yeah, that's, which, so be, that's a sunk cost, which is expensive. But I'll, I'll argue a lot cheaper than building generators or batteries. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm just about done. So conclusions... Uh, with a local, this pre-filtering local control, this demand dispatch can do amazing things. And one thing I love to say to an economics audience is, hey, I tricked you. That's the real-time market. So today there's an auction every 15 minutes, you know, and, and there's power deviation done through markets. In the Pacific Northwest, they don't have that. You know? And this purple signal could be obtained through the fishery, the refrigeration systems for the fisheries in, in Oregon and Washington State. You know, real-time markets cause a lot of computation expense. If you did through automation, it would be so much simpler and cheaper. Generators don't like ramping up and down. Why not let the water heaters do it? <laughs> um, and I, I didn't, in terms of questions in engineering, I didn't talk about quality of service to consumers. There's a law of large numbers which gives the mean field model. There's also a central limit theorem. And when we first saw the quality of service distribution to the water heaters, we were really upset. But then we realized we could just truncate it. And it, it, was, it was only a 1% uh, uh, error in the model. You know? So it, it looks like, like it might be 5%, but in closed loop, if you just do opt out, 
any, whenever a load is near its thresholds, it just says, forget it, I'm out of the system. You end up only having 1% opting out. But we need, we need a better science for imposing QoS constraints. And there's a, there's a period, periodicity that was mentioned, the time varying nature of loads. There's a lot of robustness here. I don't know if it's a big deal or not. The network issues, transmission, that's an issue. And is there a conflict or harmony between distribution and transmission? I have no idea. In economics, I'm sure this is much cheaper than batteries, you know, to get, especially with big commercial buildings, things like that. Chillers are fantastic sources of, of virtual storage. And it would be very easy to get things going. But there's big sunk cost, and that's the problem today. That's not appreciated in economic theory in the power area. And so it's, that's why it's very slow to get things started. You know, because there's this idea of frictionless markets and that everything's marginal cost. Well, no. I'm going to have to invest many you know, thousands of dollars to get this stuff going. And then it's free. You know, it's basically free. Nobody feels anything. Once you spend that, that investment, it goes for 100 years and it's all free. And the economic theory for situations where there's a high sunk cost and very low marginal cost is basically non-existent. You know, if you say you've solved that, well, then tell the music industry because they don't know what to do today. <laughs> it's a situation that's very similar. Um, so, but today we do it. I mean, Florida Power and Light has had contracts for services since the 80s, and they can shut down 132.23 megawatts in 40 seconds, <laughs> like that, because they have contracts with ho homeowners for water heaters, pool pumps, and so forth. And so, if they've been doing that for so long, and consumers are happy, then then why can't we get a lot more? Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I was. I took over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you kind of covered it at a few points, but I wouldn't mind if you discussed in a bit more detail about how you think these sorts of things could be incentivized. For example, what you need to get a rebate back, let's say, for having a pool or having a fridge. Do you have any idea what the relative rebate should be or how you price that in or what sort of contracts? Just, yeah. just, it's not a control point. Yeah, it's such a tragedy, the commons problem, because yeah. you know, the, the value for each fridge is so small, but you put them all together and it's infinite. You know, it's, really, it's really difficult. So at Florida Power and Light, they found it was worthwhile to give a few bucks a year and then you know, a, a buck or two per event, and they promise no more than three events per year. They promise if they shut off your water heat, it'll be for no more than 20 minutes. If they do shut off your uh, HVAC system, they have to document why. They have to say the hurricane was coming. And, and the thing is that all of that creates a public service feeling. People feel like they're saving the state. And so a lot of it is, you know, and, and also there's this, the Balji's gone now, but there's that the social uh, uh, pressure must be part of it. You know, a, a million Floridians signing up is amazing, and it must be that their neighbors did it. You know, uh, so I'm sure that, that it's going to be things like, you know, that sort of social pressure that'll come in. Because if you tried to pay mileage payments, if you tried to pay service to the fridge based on how much it ramped up and down, it's. I mean, it, it would be nothing. <laughs> it would be. You know, it would be people, and people would just get what people just get greedy and want more. <laughs> you know. Um, so I, yeah, so it's, it's a really, the social issues there are really interesting, you know, but way beyond my uh, expertise. But, but the thing is, I challenge anyone who's proposing real-time prices for loads, you're, you're, you're competing against Florida Power and Light that can shed 122.23 megawatts in 40 seconds, you know, leave it down for 32 minutes, bring it back up, <laughs> and everyone's happy, and they've been doing it for 20 years. So anyone here who says, I can do it through real-time prices, you've got you've to gotta compete with Florida Power and Light. You've got to prove it. Prove it. <laughs> I don't believe it. I mean, if you want to track a purple curve like that, you're going to have automation, get consumers out of the loop. And, you'll ha and, and to get them signed up, I'm sure a lot of it's going to be making them feel good, <laughs> you know, making them feel they're saving the planet, things like that. I, I, I just don't. You know, it's really, really, you know, and, and there might be standards, it's the, like they are for efficiency. You know, you have to have a smart, a, a, a grid-friendly fridge. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.